Welcome everyone to Monroe Clinics to the Point. I'm Kent McConnell, and today we are visiting with Dr. John Baisley. He's part of the Women's Health Department at Monroe Clinic, specializing in endometriosis. Doctor, welcome. Thank you. How about telling us a little bit about yourself, such as perhaps where you grew up, uh, where you attended school, and what, uh, what made you arrive at Monroe Clinic? Well, sure, Kent. I grew up in a little small town called Green Cove Springs, Florida, about 40 miles south of Jacksonville. Kind of a similar town at that time to Monroe, about 10,000 people. And uh, so I went to college up in Omaha, Nebraska at Creighton University and stayed there uh, for medical school as well. I knew even in uh, oh, elementary school probably that uh, I was interested in medicine. So I spent eight years in Nebraska. From there, we uh, went on to my residency training in Pontiac, Michigan uh, at North Oakland Medical Center. And uh, during that residency training in OBGYN, I decided that I wanted to get a little bit different experience than uh, many other people. And so I signed on with the uh, United States Navy. The Navy helped tremendously with getting me uh, a start. But uh, my wife and I felt like it was time to get back home. Part of our look included Monroe, Wisconsin. And Monroe basically reminded me of what I grew up with in North Florida. We came here in July of 2003. So we're almost 18 years here now and really have made this our home. We've really come to truly enjoy the community. Uh, my wife was on the uh, school board for uh, a decade. Um, we've met wonderful, wonderful people here in town from all walks of life. And uh, it's really been a rewarding career here in Monroe. And uh, I've been able to practice the depth of general OBGYN medicine uh, throughout my time here. So we're really happy to be here and, and excited that uh, we have all the opportunities for, for my kids uh, to grow and develop here and, and really enjoy being part of a wonderful community. So that's, uh, that's me. And uh, I practice uh, the full scope of general OBGYN. Endometriosis is our topic today and that well within the scope of what we do in general obstetrics and gynecology. Well, you're mentioning endometriosis. Uh, that is our subject matter today. And you're going to have to clue me in as well as many of our listeners. Uh, what exactly is endometriosis? Well, sure. It's a condition uh, for women, obviously, that um, is defined as the presence of endometrial glandular tissue that instead of being confined within the uterine cavity, which we call the endometrial cavity or uterine cavity, the tissue ends up being implanted outside of the uterus, either on the outside surface of the uterus or within the abdominal cavity or uh, pelvic uh, area. It can implant on the surface of ovaries. It can implant on the intestines. It can implant on the lining of the abdomen called the peritoneum. And so it's that presence of tissue that's supposed to stay within the uterus being spread outside of the uterus that is the definition of endometriosis. What are the signs and or symptoms of endometriosis? So the big problem that we see most commonly is pain. And when women have painful periods or they have painful cramping before or during or even after their periods, sometimes painful sex, and sometimes it can lead to infertility. Those are many of the common signs or complaints that uh, people will bring to us that makes us consider endometriosis as the possible cause for those uh, symptoms. Once someone has been diagnosed with endometriosis, what are their next steps for treatment? We're going to backtrack just a little bit in order sure. to talk about how to actually make the diagnosis because that's really um, important to try and establish before we begin a treatment. The, the standard 
mechanism or method for diagnosing endometriosis is to do a surgical investigation of the abdomen and pelvis. And instead of the old-fashioned, what we called laparotomy, or making an incision in the abdomen, fairly large incision, and looking for it directly, the advent of laparoscopic surgery made the investigation and the ability to make the diagnosis much, much more tenable and much less invasive and uncomfortable for patients. So in the last 30 to 40 years, that has become the standard way for us to evaluate for endometriosis. And we essentially make an incision uh, in the belly button area. It's about the size of a thumbnail. And through that incision, we'll place an instrument called a trocar, and that is a tube that we then can pass a camera or other instruments through uh, to get into the abdomen. In order to do this, we have to inflate the abdomen, and we use carbon dioxide gas to inflate it. Then we can look and examine the organs, we can examine the bowels, and we can examine the uterus and the ovaries, the fallopian tubes. We can look at the appendix. We can see all of those pelvic organs and then evaluate to see if there are lesions uh, or what we call implants of endometriosis. And sometimes uh, we see scar tissue or, or what we call adhesions, which can obstruct and block the fallopian tubes or make the tubes and ovaries stick to other organs. And those are many times causes for the pain. And then we have ways that we stage this uh, to determine the severity of, of the disease. And that staging will oftentimes dictate the mechanism and methods that we would treat. There are also some non-surgical uh, approaches, and those are typically based on the findings of what we call an endometrioma or a lesion or a mass within the ovary itself of endometriosis or on the findings on physical exam of nodules or lumpiness in the posterior aspect of the vaginal wall. We're able to make a, a presumptive diagnosis for endometriosis and then we can discuss treatment options with patients. There are certainly some ideas that we might be able to use some modern lab techniques, but those are still more in, in research. They're not really the established method that we would make the diagnosis. So once we have a patient with whatever her specific symptoms are, then we can start working on treatment, and the treatment has to be based on each patient's goals. So for instance, with the most common age group being age 25 to 35 for diagnosing endometriosis, we're going to have quite a variety of goals in that age group. There may be women in that age group who are hoping to have a family because they have not had children yet, or we may even have people in that age group who have finished having children and they're not trying to have a family. And because some of our treatments can involve basically removing the option for having children, we need to talk to patients about those goals. When we have younger women, teenage women, who are not having any interest in having children, but are having pain and problems, uh, they're not able to either go to school or participate in sports um, and not able to, uh, or maybe having uh, issues where they're having to call in and miss work. Those are people who we want to preserve their fertility, but we also want to help treat their pain. So we're going to use medical treatments over any permanent surgical treatments for them. So now that we have a little bit of an idea of how we get to a diagnosis, then what are those uh, steps in treatment? When we are in doing a laparoscopic surgery, we can take biopsies of the endometriosis lesions, send that off to pathology to confirm it, and in doing that biopsy, we remove the abnormal tissue. If we find scar tissue and adhesions, we can release those scars. We can free up the fallopian tubes and the ovaries from any uh, adhesions that are 
potentially blocking uh, the fallopian tubes, creating a fertility problem. And we can clean off any of the uh, endometriosis on the surface of the uterus, the ovaries, as well as remove the uh, cysts within the ovaries that might have endometriosis in them. If we chose a non-surgical approach, so uh, for instance, a, a young woman comes in and has having pain, is having period problems with severe cramping, say, and it's affecting, maybe she's missing school or missing work. We talk about, well, do you want to undergo a surgery to make the diagnosis, or can we go ahead and start a treatment making a presumptive diagnosis of endometriosis, knowing that in the future we may have to do an operation? So we would try then to treat, and the mainstay of therapy is birth control pills, with the goal being to minimize the menstrual periods or even eliminate the menstrual periods. And we have methods with our variety of, of medications to control the cycle and control the endometriosis pain. Obviously, it's an inflammatory process, so we can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like Motrin, ibuprofen. That's the most common method uh, and medication that we're going to uh, prescribe. When we have a patient, though, who is really unable to function in spite of medical therapy, we end up then discussing our surgical approaches and performing our surgeries, trying to preserve fertility for the patient who would like to have children again or hasn't had children. And for the patient who says, well, I'm done having children, well, then we may choose to perform a hysterectomy, remove the uterus, and then that way we no longer have to have the glandular tissue that's inside the uterus that has come spread outside, causing a uterine cramping and pain, we've removed the uterus so they can have some relief of that pain. In many patients, that does completely relieve the pain. In other patients, the endometriosis has spread and we need to treat endometriosis that's on the surface of other tissues. And when that occurs, we have medications that are designed to completely block all hormone production so that it puts a patient into a temporary menopausal state and stops their periods, stops the hormone production, and it allows that endometriosis to regress so that we treat the endometriotic lesions that either are microscopic or that we can't surgically remove. And I should take a step back and say that we also can use these injections for those women with endometriosis who desire pregnancy but are still having severe symptoms. And that can help the endometriosis regress when our oral contraceptive pills fail to, to control it. And then once we go off of that medication, then we can assist them with fertility and, and treating uh, their fertility issues. We are visiting today with Dr. John Baisley from Monroe Clinic. And doctor, how common is endometriosis and who would be at risk for developing it? Sure. So the prevalence ranges anywhere from 1% to 7% of the population. Depending on the studies you look at, it may be as low as in the 1% to 1.5%. And I've seen quotes roughly around 4% is probably the best number to use. There are certain populations that might have a higher prevalence or risk for it and certain populations that are lower. Uh, we do think race probably uh, has some predisposition so that white people and Asian people have a little bit higher risk. Blacks and Hispanics are a little bit lower risk for endometriosis. Is there anything women can do that would lower their risk? There's nothing that women can do to lower it. There are risk factors or there are factors that show a decreased risk of endometriosis, but it's hard to say you can lower your risk at least in the younger age group. But things that have shown a decreased risk are having multiple children. So multiple births would would decrease the risk. Extended periods of breastfeeding would do that. Women who've had a late onset of the start of their period after age 14 show, show a lower risk of endometriosis. But those, again, aren't things that you can control and do. So it's not something that you, as a woman, can actually 
do something active to prevent this from occurring. If any of our listeners out there, doctor, would like to make an appointment with you, how would they be able to do that? Uh, sure. We have uh, the main phone number for the Women's Health Department, which is 324-2250. Or we also have our office down in Freeport called Highland Women's Care. And that is area code 815-233-0999. All right. Anything else you'd like to add, doctor? Well, this is certainly one of those conditions that uh, many women have, and we would certainly want to help to make the people as pain-free as we can. I think that a lot of women have suffered over the years, and I think that culturally, um, many mothers were told by their mothers that this is just how it is and you have to endure it. And they then tell their daughters the same thing. I think that we are seeing more awareness that we don't have to be miserable with periods, but that is still not pervasive in our society. And so I think that we are obviously willing to listen and, and help, but if people feel like they don't have an ear or they can't complain um, that this is just how women have to endure a painful period or painful intercourse, then they suffer in silence. And uh, I think that we should try to get uh, people to be aware and really look into these kind of things because there is help and we're able to make their lives much better and not lose out on opportunities that they might otherwise choose to skip uh, because of the pain. Dr. Baisley, thank you for being with us today. It was my pleasure, Kent. Thank you so much for asking me to be here. We've been visiting today with Dr. John Baisley, part of the Women's Health Department at Monroe Clinic. For Monroe Clinic, I'm Kent McConnell, and this has been Monroe Clinic's To The Point.